is uh, an interview with the Bronx African American History Project on February 21st, 2007 uh, at Long Island University in Brooklyn, New York with Cleo Silvers, a longtime labor activist and political organizer who was very involved in the Lincoln Hospital struggle and with the Black Panther Party in the Bronx. Today we have as interviewers Lalit Clarkson uh, and Dr. Mark Mason. Uh, the way we begin our interviews is, is to have uh, people talk a little bit about their family. So could you tell us a little bit about your family and how growing up in that family shaped your political activism? Absolutely. Yeah. I actually come from a very interesting background in that I had access to uh, my ancestors, if you will, through my grandmothers on both sides. When I was a little girl, um, my grandmother on my father's side, and uh, my father's side was the slave side, there were two sides of my family, one was slave and one was free. Uh, that was my mother's side of the family, or free, and I'll tell you all about that. But my grandmother on my father's side used to braid my hair and sit me in the kid her knees and tell me all about slavery. And tell me all about, because she was two years old when slavery ended in this country. Her sister, who was ten years older than her, had actually been a slave and uh, had actually worked in the field and had become a teacher. And she told me all these things when I was getting, you know, as a little kid, before I started school. I knew all about slavery and how the master treated you, but, but partly because I was a nosy kid, and I used to sit around and listen to what the old people talked about around the clock belly stove. Because when I was a little kid, we didn't have uh, indoor toilets, and we had, we had to go outside, we had a big garden. Now this was in Philadelphia? Outside, right outside of Philadelphia, right outside the International Airport in a community called Elmwood. Uh -huh. And Elmwood is, is still uh, not built up completely. Was this a predominantly African-American community? Predominantly African-American, but it was fully integrated. We had Polish people, mm -hmm. we had uh, Native Americans, we had gypsies. And it was this kind of community that had all these different kinds of people, and Italians. Uh, and so I had access to like lots of different kinds of people, and of course, my school was mostly African American, but there were pockets of kids from all the other communities in Angwood that were there, and all of our teachers were white. So we we were, and I, what I consider to be very well educated uh, from kindergarten up through the sixth grade. Did your family belong to a church? Yes. Well, actually, that's how my family got there to Philadelphia. From South Carolina, Greenville, South Carolina, uh, there were three churches that brought people to uh, the north. Uh, this is my father's side of the family again. And it was People's Baptist Church, which was our church, Calvary Baptist Church, and Beulah Baptist Church. Calvary Baptist Church was the church, I believe, of Patty LaBelle. Patty LaBelle, uh, and I grew up. I grew up next door to Patty LaBelle's house on Ashwood Avenue, and we consider ourselves to be cousins. But Jackie, her, her younger sister, and I used to play mud cakes together. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that community brought a group of people up to Philadelphia when they first settled on Callahan Street. Now I know all this from my grandmother's mm -hmm. uh, telling me about What year did the settlement begin? Uh, I believe in the 20s, the uh, mm -hmm. early 20s. Mm -hmm. And uh, they settled on Callahan Street and then they picked up and moved outside of Philadelphia to Elmwood. Mm -hmm. And that's how Elmwood evolved with these three churches and African Americans. Wow, so there were three African American churches in Elmwood. That's were, were a large percentage of the people from South Carolina in your community? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, they were from one and one little area in South Carolina. Wow, that's amazing. And, they, and then, of course, there were other people that moved in, mm -hmm. you know, people from different areas, Georgia, Arkansas, mm -hmm. uh, Alabama. But mostly there were people from South Carolina. Mm -hmm. So that's my father's side of the family, the slave guys. 
my mother's side of the family, uh, my, when I went to visit my grandmother, 8515 Osteen Avenue, that address is the address of a stop on the um, Underground Railroad. My mother's grandfather, Frisbee Green, was a freedman who came to the United States from Haiti on a merchant ship at 14 years old. And he wanted to came to the United States to engage in the anti-slave rebellions in Louisiana. He could read and write. Uh, eventually he became uh, an abolitionist, traveled around the United States up and down the East Coast, and uh, was friends with Frederick Douglass. Now how do I know all this? I have letters dating from 1842 up to 1901 written by Frisbee back and forth between him and the family and friends, and close marks all up and down the East Coast. He talks about riding on trains, working in hotels, and going to meetings. Um, those letters, I have uh, some of them at my house, which I keep. Do you have them professionally preserved? No, not mine. My sister donated hers to the Schomburg. Right. And they can be found in the archives of the Schomburg in a, uh, an archive called the Green Family Letters. The Green Family Letters. Yes. It's really green. So that was my mother's side of the family. And my grandmother wanted to make sure that we had these um, these letters and all these documents from Grizzly. We have a picture of them um, and all of that. So that we would be aware of our background. So, um, I, but when I was young, when I was really young, like five or six, I really didn't get it. You know, people used to say, my grandmother's brother, brother in law, was one of the only people that graduated from college. I mean, people would come by on Sunday afternoons to shake his hand, to talk to him. Uncle Ed. Now, did he gone to a uh, traditionally black college? Yes. And, you know, he had a college degree, and mm -hmm. he was kind of, people just came around to discuss things with them, mm -hmm. get him to write for them. Mm -hmm. um, but I still, and I was like, I don't know why you think of that. It's so cool. It's still to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Five years old, that's kind of my attitude for the whole thing. But I didn't really get the whole thing. And I didn't understand why that house was such a big deal for right. But as I grew up and as I grew older and learned about you know, what the role of the family had played uh, during slavery, and I started to get, get it clear that this was like pretty, something pretty important stuff. Okay, so I was raised by, I was born into a family with a very young mother. My mother was 18 when she had me. She was very beautiful. Um, and she had had a child previous to me out of wedlock, uh -huh. which in 1946, when she married my father in 1944, 45, uh -huh. that was like really a horrible thing. It was unbelievable. My father was 12 years older than my mother. And um, he had been a boxer and a baseball player. Uh -huh. And there is a picture of me somewhere on his shoulders at a Negro League baseball game. Because he had been a manager and then he was out there. And he played out there in Elmwood quite a bit. So there, there was a ballpark in Elmwood where there were Negro League games. Yes. Do you remember the name of the park? Um, 84th Street Park. Okay. It was 84th Street Park. Wow. Um, or, yeah. Uh -huh. It was either 84th Street Park. Do you have any pictures of, of the park? I don't. And there is a picture of me somewhere my family has. Um, and that picture is of me on my father's shoulder mm -hmm. at the end. Right. So um, that's all I got. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's all I got. But I, but I just do you know I talked to my uncle, who was 90, mm -hmm. 92, who reminded me that he and my father had been uh, active in the Negro League management. Mm -hmm. And that they had taken me to the mm -hmm. And that was very recently that I spoke to him. 
So my, my mom was really too messy. She was really, really smart. She had a, she spoke French and English fluently. And she uh, had a photographic memory. So I learned how to read at about three years old. My mother it was kind of like, you know, she was reading all the time. And I think that it seemed to me that I figured that she could do this, I could do it too. So, so I learned how to read very, very early. And it was kind of interesting because I used to go on the subway and people used to give me money because I was so little. And I could read and people would be like, you know, they give my face some money and she could read. You know, so my father was um, an older guy, a boxer, kind of, you know, that tough guy. <laughs> and um, he was also very smart. Very, very smart. You know. Neither of them got an opportunity to go to college. So they, but they did make sure that that my sister and I, and five, we had one sister who was uh, five years younger, and a brother who was two years older. That the child that right. my mother had out of life, which we can't find, by the way. He's lost. You know, we're actually looking for him. Anyway.
NATO. And so Mr. Duchovny, who was a NATO lieutenant, spent all his time talking about communism and explained to us why it was bad and had it having us read and all this stuff. And I, my view of this whole thing was, if your definition of communism is to each according to his needs, from each according to his ability, mm -hmm. and the other um, system, economic system that you're describing is um, kind of dog eat dog, whoever is the whoever is the most the, the best and, and uh, is the person that survives. To me, the the other one sounds more fair. Now this is a ten year old thing, right? So let's <laughs> not. <laughs> oh, that's my wife. I better. Um, never mind. I'll, I'll go around. Um, was Paul Robeson a figure in your family's house? Was yes. there somebody with his was, records and his? He was loved by my family, but he was loved in the, with all of the other I iconistic. Oh, really? They're from Elmwood. Right, right, from Elmwood. They're from Elmwood? From Elmwood, 
to Washington, D.C. for an application for VISTA. Sent it back, filled out the application, never thinking that they would actually call me to be a VISTA volunteer. Come to find out I was like the second, the first or second mm -hmm. black African American woman to join VISTA. Mm -hmm. So um, then they sent me a letter saying, pack your things, this is what you should take, and come to Baltimore. And you're a VISTA volunteer. So I met with the other VISTA volunteers were people. I was in the class with Jay Rockefeller uh, and some other really, really rich kids. Uh -huh. um, I think my first boyfriend was a Yale and then I met in VISTA. His name. <laughs> 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 he was actually a very nice, nice boy. And um, yeah, it's it's just you know. <laughs> now, now that was training in Baltimore, and your first assignment was. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, um, describe your first impressions about arriving in the South Bronx. Well, you gotta know that. I mean, I come from. I don't. I never really knew anything about Catholicism. So, my assignment when I came to the South Bronx was um, St. Anselm's Church and the New York City Housing Authority. What street was St. Anselm's on? St. Anselm's is on the St. Anselm's on St. Anselm's Street. So it's St. Anselm's in New York, right by the Kennedy. For fifty first? Yeah, we'll fifty first and Okay. Say now. And which by the way, my, my first husband was a priest at St. Anson's Church. Who left the priest in the house. Right. But anyway, oh, did you know that? No. <laughs> so how many people have you taken out of the church? No, this is the one. This the one. Yes. Um, <laughs> And that's, in, by the way, though, that's an urban legend. Mm -hmm. I met a woman a few years ago who, when I was working at the, at the community school district five. Mm -hmm. And she says, you know, I heard the story of this black woman that came into the neighborhood and stole one of the priests. And they were right out in the open with it. And I said to her, I said, well, I said, I married one of the priests of St. Anthony. She went to St. Anthony. And she was like 10 years old when this happened. Uh -huh. she was like, and I said, I, I actually was married to Father Philip. She's like, it was you! It was you! Uh -huh. I said, yes, it was me. Right. I married Father Philip. That's true. But anyway, uh, my impressions. <laughs> my impressions of the South Bronx was first of all, I always liked stuff when it's different. Mm -hmm. And it was different. Uh, what I was concerned about was that um, the conditions were very, very bad. Mm -hmm. they were very bad. Uh, worse than I could imagine. This is like uh, the housing conditions, especially? The housing conditions, well, uh, and my experience uh, with the education, you know, that was the first thing that I did. And was you working in schools? Yeah, well, we, my partner and I went to volunteer. We, as a VISTA volunteer, your job was to do what was necessary, what the community wanted. Right. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we did, we went to the school and offered to two kids mm -hmm. at the elementary school. Do you remember what elementary school was? 151. Which was on? On 58th and Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, where the principal told me that the kids were just garbage mm -hmm. and that they would never be anything. That's what the and principal. Do you remember the principal's name? I don't remember this principal's name. Now, was this was what was the ethnic composition of the students? Puerto Rican and black. Uh huh. In Trinity what? Avenue was straight right. Puerto Rican black. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's all it was in the neighborhood. Right. I, I think that's basically. Uh -huh. um, and or, and there were like two or three people from like the Bahamas that lived around there. Right. On Forest uh -huh. Avenue. But essentially, it was Puerto Rican and African American, African -American. Yeah. right? So, yes. Um, and he said that these kids are nothing. They are guard. Best you can do. I got a couple of them. That's the best. Read ones that's in grade, graduating, and read one second grade level. If you want to make a 
disrupt the rest of the school. If you want to take them and work with them, we can do that. So we took eight kids, all reading on the second grade level, and we developed our own uh, educational theory on how to work with them. But of course, you know, we were reading Summer Hill, reading all the, the books on new educational uh, ideas and stuff. And we decided that we would find out what the kids were like. But before we did that, we had to go to the kids' homes and talk to the parents and ask their parents if it was okay for us to work with them. So that's how I started to learn Spanish. Because when we go to the kids' high homes, you have to talk to the parents. Most of the parents didn't speak English. And so the kids would say, Oh, tell mama that uh, she's a Kandeha first. And then you can start talking, you know, ask her stuff, and I'll translate for you. But I would, I would say the kids said, you know, they say, yeah, you're okay, man, I'm friendly. And the, the parents would be like laughing. You know, they would tell me to say things like, money comes. Right. You know, right. you know? Right. 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 I would be, you know, and the parents would be laughing. And I figured out that they would keep me out of hers. So. Um, yeah, they did taught me how to curse, and then I, of course, learned a little Spanish along the way. But now, well, um, had you been exposed to Latin music at all growing up in Philadelphia? No. Because that's, you know, so not at all. Yeah, so, not this, at all. so what was it like the first time you heard Latin music? I was like, oh, I like this. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was really like Now, were there, were, did you encounter like men playing the congas in the street? The streets and, the, and everything. Yeah, so that, that, and... And it just the music was, by the way, music was coming from everywhere. Everybody's window was open yeah, and the music was just playing loud on the streets and it was food and... and the smell was so It was amazing. What an amazing new culture, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's just completely different than anything I'd ever experienced, mm -hmm. you know? Did you connect this to your community and see like connections, like you know, African traditions being oh, reflected in different ways in these two different cultures? Absolutely, absolutely, and I can see it more, even more now, uh -huh. as as I consider all the different traditions and, and the way people interact. Uh -huh. Give me one real good example. I always, in my house, people are going to come to your house, you clean up the house real good. Never let anybody come to your house if it was messy. Mm -hmm. You know, it may be messy when you're there, when the family's there, if somebody's coming to your house, you're going to clean up. And in a person's house, the Puerto Rican's house, anytime you go to somebody's house, the house is immaculate, always clean. And it's these women that like they're really concerned about keeping the house clean. You know, you said, and that's, you know, and also feeding people when they come to the mm -hmm. house. That's why we have triple XL shirts in the box <laughs> American History Project. And, and uh, you can't go into a Puerto Rican home yeah. without having, if you go there in the morning, you're going to have cafe con leche, you're going to have fun. Mm -hmm. Okay? You can't, I mean, it's just part of the tradition. And at lunchtime, you're going to eat some rice and beans. Mm -hmm. And at dinner time, you're going to have rice and beans and meat. And the salad, and, and I mean, you just this is what you're going to have. And, this, and when you go to somebody's house at dinner time, an African American, you're going to have stomach chicken and rice and some green beans or something like this. I mean, some greens, you have fried chicken, macaroni and cheese, I tell you. That's the way it is. So that's the way the culture works, you know. We, and what used to be is that, oh, you little Cleofa, you can't go. You better go to school. I'm going to call your grandmother and tell you you're not in school right now. And they would do that. And they would watch work when I came to New York. Everybody on the block knew all the kids. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the kids could be acting up, but somebody was going to call right. somebody. Now, where, you, where, what was your, where was your first apartment? Was it in a walk up or? In a back
because this is, you know, which. So you're, you're living in a tenement on 158. You're working in the schools. Right at the corner. Right. Across the street. On and, the and now, at this point, are you in contact with any political organizations in no, the community? Absolutely not. You can know that uh, there is a picture of myself and my partner that became a uh, picture for the VISTA Volume the Service to America brochure for that year, 1967-68. Uh -huh. And it's a picture of me and my partner on in the back of our building talking to a group of kids. Right. Because now, we're going to be doing gang. Now, the next time we do the interview, if, can you bring some photos? Like the, I have to go. I have no, no. I've been looking for them. Uh -huh. I've been trying to track down this photo. And there was also an article on top of us because we're a white girl and a black girl. Right. Mr. Volunteer mm -hmm. in the South Bronx uh, by the New York Times. Mm -hmm. New York Times. Yeah. Right. That's your take. Okay. So that's 60, 67. 67. And at this point, you're not in touch with any political organizations, but you're aware of this grave injustice being done Absolutely. in the local schools. In the local schools, and I was going from the schools when I was going with the parents to the welfare department. I was going with the, with the kids' parents to the uh, to the hospital, to Lincoln Hospital emergency room. Oh, okay. People were waiting for 36 hours to get uh, seen in the emergency room. 36 hour wait in the emergency room. Yes. Um, there was drug addiction, you know, 25% of the people in the, in the South Bronx at that time were addicted to heroin, right. some kind of drug. And so you um, saw the heroin right out there? I was, would be like standing on the corner and drug addicts being tied out on the stoop. Uh, housing, remember that kids were getting beaten up. I was working for the housing authority. It was bitten by rats. Then paint chips, we gave brain damage. I saw all of this stuff. I came in contact directly. So by this time, the, 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 the housing conditions in the projects were deteriorating? Well, in the projects, but that was mostly in the tenements. In the tenements. I did my organizing mostly. Uh -huh. well, I worked for the housing authority where they did code enforcement. Right. So people would call up with, you know, we have no heat and hot water. Um, the ceiling is just fell down in my bathroom because somebody upstairs flooded their bathtub. A rat bit the kid. Um, was this after Vista? No, so this is during Vista. During Vista, you, you did housing authority work as well as education work. Yeah, I, the sponsor for Vista volunteers was New York City Housing Authority. Oh. And St. Anthony's Church. Okay. So that's where the two sponsors and I stay with the housing authority mm -hmm. in the afternoon as we did work in the community. The other work, the important work that came from the housing authority was the establishment of the Kelly Street Block Association. Mm -hmm. Kelly Street Block Association, I believe, was the first. My building, 158 and Trinity Line, mm -hmm. we were responsible for organizing that. Now, what, what did the Block Associations do with that? Now, wait. 
when did you become involved with issues at Lincoln Hospital? Well, since the, at the end of 67, after I got married, I came, it was over. Mm -hmm. um, and somebody said, they're hiring community mental health. Right. Said to me, you should go over and get an interview. Which I did. Mm -hmm. I probably went over to Lincoln Hospital and interviewed for a position as a community mental health worker. Well, of course, you know, this was like three weeks. We left right in. Um, I was interviewed by the leadership, the three main leaders of the community of Dawkins and all the Dawkins. And they watched the interview and the two way there. The two way there. They collectively decided on who they were going to hire. And I happened to be one of the candidates that got hired. And from that point I, on, I was swept up in the struggle. Thank you. 
predominantly African American. The constituency is African male to find one besides DC 37. That they being like 1199, they're picking African American with an outlook for that. But how, if you, I mean, if I say that to you, and you, you're not living it, you're not feeling it, you're not seeing it, you don't have friends that are African American women who are um, trying to move up in society or are involved in you know, what's happening in society, you don't know. But I know African American women who are, are big in business, who are even from Wall Street, who are being kicked out of those positions and looking for ways to looking for ways to get people to understand what's happening to us. You know, why is it that we're not being, although you can't, I mean, we're not afraid, we're not intimidated, so we're not easily intimidated. We do easily stop. And I think what they're looking for in society today is people who are willing to stand up for themselves. A little more afraid of the powers of people. A little more willing to bend with the uh, way in which things should go, the way in which people think things should go. Our view is that there is a way, there's a right way to do things, and there's a way that equality and justice. And if it's not happening, we're probably going to say something about it. And we're probably not going to be afraid. I, 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 my feeling today is that I think that they're trying to intimidate us. And I'm sorry, at 60 years old, I'm not going to be intimidated. You know, because there's only a few, I don't have that much longer to go, there's only a few more things you can do. I have experienced every bad, horrible thing that could happen to an individual human being. I'm still here, I'm still surviving, and I'm not going to be intimidated. If you take my job away, I will scrub floors. Okay, so if I can't do this, or what I was doing before, or something better, I was, I'm not afraid to struggle for I've done it before. You know, I'm, I'm not afraid to be a be back, you know. So you can do that to me. You can try to beat me up. You can try to intimidate me. You can try to diminish my humanity and the character of, of, of who I am. But you can't stop me from living unless you feel it. Part of the problem is that we are pretty strong characters. Now, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it's tough for people who would like to intimidate you. You know, they'd like to when not come. And you know, we can really scare this person. And for some, I think that um, men by the not are not as uh, confrontational. And, and as a matter of fact, I don't really think that uh, black women are confrontational. I think it's just that we stand our very hard to push us back. Uh, and if we're intelligent, it's very hard to give an intelligent reason for treating you that, in a way that's not equal. <laughs> so that's the point. You know, so if you, you're just going to do something to somebody, you don't have a reason. You don't want to do it to a black woman. So you get rid of them. <laughs> okay, why don't we, you know, I, at least I have to go, why don't we set up... Scare you, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you scared me before. I'm used to it. Anyway. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Mark. I, I, I have to say that. I have to get that out because I'm, you know... That's no, no, it, it's who you are. And, and, and people, people are going to hear this interview. Don't... This is <laughs> going to be a very popular interview. Uh, well, we, let me just tell you what we what happens because uh, we'll oh, let me turn this off. We you get a copy of everything that.